thank you. Thank you all so much for coming out on this chilly evening. This is so wonderful to see everybody here to hear this wonderful topic. Um, and thank you especially to Valerie for her generosity in offering to come and share her expertise with us tonight. Welcome and thank you for coming. I'm grateful to Star for having me here this evening. I'm excited to talk about my book, Paranormal, A New Testament Scholar Looks at the Afterlife, because I firmly believe that its findings are important to all of us. Paranormal, a self-published book, was a three-year project in which I examined four types of evidence for the survival of the individual soul after death. Scientific instruments and techniques, near-death experiences, reputable psychics and mediums, and out-of-body experiences. The evidence is overwhelming beyond a reasonable doubt that we survive death, that in fact there is no death. Let that sink in for a moment. The evidence also points to the truth of reincarnation and past lives, karma, and pre-birth decisions. The evidence further shows that our loved ones who have crossed over know what we're up to. They do not miss out on any important life events, and moreover, that there are ways that they try to communicate with us and that we can communicate with them. I'm throwing these findings at you to start with because they're so important. Not only as we contemplate what happens when we die, but because if we incorporate them into our lives in the physical world, they can truly help us in crucial ways to live those lives more fully. So let me start by giving an overview of some of that evidence with quotes from the book. So scientific instruments and techniques. Scientific e examination of the afterlife goes back to the 19th and early 20th centuries in Europe and the US, mainly because of the beginning of widespread use of electricity. In the book, I describe electronic voice phenomena, EVPs, and how they are categorized, instrumental transcommunication, ITC, and various electronic devices for ghost hunting that have been developed by trained engineers and tested in professional investigations. <coughs> EVPs are voices of the deceased coming through tape and video recordings. They are classified as A, B, or C samples. Okay. A class A sample is clear and recognizable. It can be heard and understood over a speaker by most people. A class B sample, somewhat clear and definable, can be heard over a speaker, but not everyone may agree with the translation. A class C sample is unclear and hard to understand, but listeners can acknowledge that an unexplainable sound was recorded. How do EVPs work? What mechanisms or principles might be involved in EVPs? What are the relationships between the electronics of the instruments used and the sounds and voices that are heard on the recordings, especially when the voices are not heard by the people in the instrument's vicinity until the tape is played back and sometimes played back in reverse? In EVP, the voice that is heard in the recording may be formed from available audio frequency energy, which is basically just noise. Some noise seems to work better than others. The most optimum noise appears to be broad spectrum audio containing many voice frequencies and providing numerous optional stable states. That's a quote. And I'm not an engineer, so these are, you know. Um, in other words, since an ent entity on the other side no longer has physical vocal cords like those of us in the physical world, available frequencies appear to be selected by the entity and given more power to emulate voice. The entity must consciously intend to communicate and is thus, quote, able to reduce the amount of energy required to change the state of a system thereby causing the system to assume a desired state, unquote. 
The working hypothesis of what an entity is doing to produce a voice recording on a physical instrument, then, is that a trans-etheric influence is initiated by an etheric personality as a subtle energy expression of intention that acts on physical processes to select required energy states to form a desired effect. Unquote. That's a mouthful. All right. <clears throat> ITC, Instrumental Transcommunication, includes EVPs but is broader and was classified at a later date. I'm going to just do selections of this. Um, ITC can be viewed as a set of energy dependent phenomena. It is linked to the survival hypothesis which, quote, holds that there are levels of reality differentiated by changes in characteristics of energy. Physical death is when a self transitions out of a physical lifetime into a non-physical lifetime. The personality of that human continues in a different aspect of reality. EVP and mediumship are thought to be evidence that non-physical entities can occasionally penetrate the veil between realities. And I'm going to give some examples from um, Tom and Lisa Butler in um, the book, There Is No Death and There Are No Dead. Uh, those on this side of the veil, the physical world, have reported receiving phone calls from deceased friends and relatives. Some of the calls are described as sounding hollow, as if in a tunnel. Entities from the other side come through clearly and intelligently via answering machines. Anybody had that experience? <laughs> Faces and other features of famous or familiar deceased persons have been captured on cameras and video machines. One example shows a man with his dog. An owl is depicted in, in another example. And yet another image depicts a woman in Egyptian headdress closely resembling the photograph of Queen Nefertiti in the Egyptian Museum in Berlin. Um, they, there are other um, examples that um, you can read about if you get the book. Some of the devices used in ghost hunting are constructed to detect electromagnetic fields, EMF, and have become even more sophisticated since I wrote the book. There are heat sensors, infrared devices, so-called spirit boxes, and ovulus, and others. The one with the most poignant poignant story that I've come across is the Mel meter. The Mel meter is also a type of EMF device created by Gary Galka of DAS Distribution Incorporated. It is named after Galka's daughter, Melissa. Melissa, who was born on Valentine's Day, 1987, was killed in a car accident in 2004 when her car hit a tree. Gary and Cindy Galka sense Melissa's presence, especially around Valentine's Day every year. With the help of a Mel meter, they can hear her voice as confirmed by com comparing what is recorded on her cell phone greeting, which has never been erased, and experience her continuing love and existence. From beyond the grave, Melissa confirms that she is at peace. <coughs> The Ghost Adventures TV team of Zach Bagans, Nick Groff, and Aaron Goodwin filmed an episode of the show on what would, should have been Melissa's 25th birthday, Valentine's Day 2012, so viewers can see for themselves how this encounter played out. The investigators not only captured Melissa's voice on tape several times, but also felt a cold spot in her bedroom and smelled perfume. Gary Galka is featured in other episodes of the Ghost Adventures TV show using some of the instruments he has developed. There's much more that can be said, but we need to move on. All right, the next example um, of the evidence is reputable uh, mediums and psychics. Who has seen Long Island Medium on the um, TLC channel? Oh, heck yeah. and, and, or even heard Teresa Caputo in person? A friend, a friend of mine actually has. Uh, Teresa is one of quite a few reputable, reputable mediums. Uh, you may also have heard of John Edward, Noreen Rainier, Chip Coffey, or Phil Jordan. 
Here I want to read a selection about James von Prague. So somebody, he's, he's quite prominent. James Van Prague is an internationally known spiritual medium and best-selling author who has appeared on countless television shows for over 30 years. According to his website, quote, he has been recognized as one of the most accurate spiritual mediums working today. His messages have brought solace, peace, and spiritual insights, changing millions of uh, view of both life and death. He has received many awards for dedicating himself to changing the consciousness of the planet, unquote. He has channeled evidential details from many famous deceased personalities like Marilyn Monroe, Slim Pickens, Rock Hudson, Frank Sinatra, Roy Orbison, Lucille Ball, Andrew Carnegie, Liberace, Princess Diana, Michael Jackson, Johnny Carson, Gandhi, Edgar Cayce, Benjamin Franklin, and even Abraham Lincoln. Among the many wise messages has, he has received from these and his spirit guides are information regarding reincarnation, group karma, and pre-birth decisions. Group death occurs when a number of people leave as a soul group. That is, they die together in a natural disaster, bombing, or plane crash in order to fulfill a karmic debt. Group karma can also refer to the karma of a group of people or nation. Reincarnation or the return to the physical world as another human being with the same soul is affirmed time and again by Van Prague as it is for many others. A soul spends the time between incarnations, quote, familiarizing itself with knowledge about the material level of its ex existence, unquote. An etheric council, a group of highly evolved beings, assists souls to re-enter a physical life, although it is the individual spirit that makes the final determination, an example of the fact of free will. Each incarnation has a number of tests and trials that are, quote, opportunities to develop and expand by living through adversity, unquote. While not overtly political, Van Prague, by working so closely with spirits on the other side, has reached many conclusions that might be termed progressive or liberal, which I find really interesting. Okay. Now, a third example of the evidence is uh, near-death experiences. Does anyone here want to admit publicly to having had an NDE? Mm -hmm. And I've heard of others as I've talked about this material. Um, I've now known about half a dozen people who have. Uh, many people are familiar with Dr. Eben Alexander, author of Proof of Heaven, A Neurosurgeon's Journey into the Afterlife. And you may have uh, read the book or seen the movie, Heaven is for Real, about the NDE of uh, four-year-old Colton Burpo. Here I want to read a little of why NDEs can be believed as proof of the afterlife based on studies con conducted by scientists and physicians. <coughs> All right. um, okay, first, uh, consciousness leaves the body at death. That is, having a vivid and conscious experience at the time of clinical death is among the best evidence available to suggest a conscious existence after bodily death. One cannot have a highly organized experience while unconscious or clinically dead. Uh, the common, second, the common report in an NDE of an out-of-body experience, OOBE, whereby the person near death can relate later, often in minute detail, events occurring around him or her and or things happening to his or her body is further affirmation of an afterlife, a conscious existence apart from our physical one. Um, and here's a quote, approximately half of all NDEs have an OOBE that involves seeing or hearing earthly events, unquote. Um, in a study of 617 near-death uh, accounts, 46 0.5% describe OOBEs, quote, 
that contained observations of earthly events that would allow others to objectively assess the reality of their observations. Of this group of 287 OBERs, 97.6% were found to have had out-of-body experiences that were entirely realistic and lacked any content that was unrealistic." Unquote. Third, studies of NDEs show that people born blind have entirely visual NDEs. The dreams of people born blind do not include vision, um, what I've been told. Um, so it is medically inexplicable for someone born blind to have a detailed and organized visual experience. Those born blind who have an NDE may immediately have full and clear vision. Fourth, NDEs are not the result of too much or too little anesthesia. Uh, quote, by conventional medical thinking, neither a person under anesthesia nor a person experiencing cardiac arrest should have a conscious experience like that of an NDE. Yet the, uh, the study um, that I'm quoting from um, uh, found many that do, unquote. Fifth, the life review is reported in many NDE accounts and is often transformative for the person for the rest of his or her life. In many of, of the accounts of the life review, the person sees fragments of his or her earthly life, often from a third person perspective. They see how their actions affected others, both posit positively and negatively. They judge themselves, in other words, there is no higher God judging them. And in some cases, they are aided by a spiritual guide. Of 617 NDEs studied, 14% included the life review. Quote, none of the life reviews contained content that was considered unrealistic, either to the NDE or, or to me, the uh, person conducting the study, unquote. Sixth, many people who have an NDE report joyous reunions with deceased relatives and other loved ones. Sometimes the entities encountered are not immediately recognizable to the NDE survivor, but are revealed after return to physical life. Entities who were elderly at death often appear in the NDE as in their prime of life, while children often appear older. In some cases, the spirits who appear to the person having the NDE are Jesus or the Virgin Mary. These appearances could not be the result of wishful thinking, dreaming, hallucination, or fabrication. Number seven, young children who experience NDEs report content very similar to that of adult NDE survivors so the content of NDEs is not the result of pre-existing beliefs. Furthermore, children who experience an NDE almost always report that they had less anxiety about death than people in the general population, quote, increased psychic abilities, a higher zest for life, and increased intelligence, unquote. Number eight, there is remarkable consistency about the content of NDEs from around the world. So these are not just Western occurrences. Furthermore, quote, pre-existing cultural beliefs do not significantly influence the content of NDEs, unquote. Um, I'm going to skip a little bit here. Um, number nine, um, various scientific explanations for NDEs are ultimately untenable. Even Alexander discusses several. The evolutionary argument that the experience is, quote, a primitive brainstem program to ease terminal pain and suffering, unquote. The distorted recall of memories from deeper parts of the limbic system. A mimicking of the hallucinatory an anesthetic ketamine. A dump of this long-winded chemical abbreviated DMT, which I'm not going to try to pronounce. Um, isolated preservation of cortical regions of the brain, and he goes on. Um, Alexander handily disputes all of these theories in consultation with other physicians because uh, the meningitis that he had uh, when he went into this coma was so severe and because the theories do not, quote, explain the robust, 
richly interactive nature of my recollections, unquote. Okay. So finally, um, we come to um, out-of-body experiences. The main source for OOBEs is Virginia businessman Robert Monroe, who lived from 1915 to 1995. Um, and here is uh, what some of his explorations suggest. Okay. Monroe was able to travel in spirit to friends and relatives still in the physical world, witness what they were doing at given times, and have them confirm what he reported. In October 1962, to take one example, he had an OOBE in which he visited his friend R.W. in her apartment eight miles away. As she sat in a chair, he approached her. At first, she did not notice him, but then became frightened. He backed away and was pulled back into the physical. The next day, he talked to her. And she told him that there was, quote, something hanging and waving in the air. It was like a filmy piece of gray chiffon, unquote. She had thought it might be Monroe, knowing about his experiments. So she apparently asked him to leave. And, quote, it backed away and faded out quickly, unfortunately. <laughs> um, he had several experiences in which he conversed uh, during an OOBE with someone who died at approximately the same time. And he also connected with his departed father. <coughs> Monroe inf affirmed our survival of physical death, and the training his institute provides allows people to gain this knowledge for themselves. I personally have no interest in doing his institute, but others might. Um, he experienced oneness with the universe and other beings, along with immense love. Quote, most important, you are not alone. With you, beside you, interlocked in you are others. You are bonded to them with a great single knowledge. They are exactly like you. They are you. And like you, they are home. You feel with them like gentle waves of electricity passing between you, a completeness of love. One of the greatest enigmas of this whole affair is that someone or more than one has been helping me from time to time in such experimentation." Unquote. Monroe discovered the link between thought and action. He called it thought-action synchronicity. Quote, Where is in the, whereas in the physical state action follows thought, here they are one and the same. One gradually appreciates the existence of thought as a force in itself rather than as a trigger or catalyst. It is primarily an emotional thought force, unquote. He connected with higher spiritual beings who helped him in various ways and imparted to him great wisdom. And finally, he affirmed the truth of reincarnation and past lives on earth, as well as the existence of beings who never existed in the physical world. So these examples are just the tip of the iceberg. I hope you can get a flavor for the depth and validity of what the evidence shows. Now that we have an idea about what the evidence is, let me tell you some of the history of that evidence, which puts it into context. In the book, I look at the following. A short history of the paranormal research and an appendix containing biographies of some of the illustrative 19th century investigators involved in this research. Here, I especially want to wow you with something about Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the inventor of Sherlock Holmes. I cite Doyle a lot in the book, not only because he wrote the two-volume History of Spirituality, which is fabulous, but also because he communicated about his experiences on the other side in seances through automatic writing after his death in 1930. Here's a quote. After passing through the death of the astral body, when the man discards his astral vehicle and enters the heavenly life, we there find a condition of at one attunement, a condition wherein the soul is conscious only of the one vibratory note of love and service. 
In this sphere, the soul is cognizant mainly of the great cosmic powers. In speaking of that second death, through which we all pass after experiencing a period of unconsciousness, which may last for minutes, hours, days, or even years, a period of quiescence of consciousness, we said that the spirit then wakes to life rich, vivid, renewed. The soul passes not through every mental plane, but migrates to the one particular mental plane to which he is attuned. And of course, forgive the sexist language from back then, but that was um, back then. OK. Then there are examples of current university-sponsored uh, paranormal research. Um, an examination of how and why uh, reincarnation uh, was eliminated from Christian and thus Western thought and some of the dire results that, um, of that development. I, I cover that in the book. And um, paranormal research groups, some of which have been featured in uh, popular TV programs here and abroad. Tracing this history is important, I believe, to show that scientific exploration of the afterlife and things paranormal is not new. Much of it involves highly acclaimed scientists and other scholars, and it is not necessarily theological or owned by a particular religion or belief set, even though some of the takeaways parallel certain religious tenets. Once we know about the evidence and the history of the evidence, we can see certain common themes emerge. These themes are vitally important when it comes to our lives on Earth. One of the appendices in the book is a chart of the several dozen themes and which type of evidence supports that theme. We've already noted several of these in passing from the readings. The prevalence and power of love, the survival of the soul on the other side, joyous reunions with loved ones, higher intelligences that help us, and service as essential to spiritual growth. So let me read um, just a few more examples. Um, animals' souls survive. You'll be happy to hear that if you're a pet lover. Okay. Uh, we do re reunite with our pets in the afterlife as many people hope and sense. Mediums such as Teresa Caputo and Maureen Hancock channel animal spirits to their owners, and there is a great deal of EVP evidence for post-mortem animal communication. EVPs and animal images captured by Tom and Lisa Butler, uh, Martha Copeland, um, who I mentioned earlier in the book, and many others provide evidence that spirits care for animals, not only our pets, who die suddenly or are killed. In, uh, investigator Annabella Cardosa in Portugal has reported on experiences with animal communications, including domestic animals speaking in the languages of their owners. And Monroe, we just saw, encountered many animal spirits in his journeys out of body. Uh, Lisa Butler describes how she was devastated over the fate of animals and livestock that perished in a major flood in the Midwest a number of years ago. She contacted entities on the other side, she's the EVP expert, who assured her that the animals also survive. Entities on the other side, they were told, rescue the animals and help them cross over. For a while after the tragedy, the butlers continued to contact the entities to find out how the animals were faring. And finally, after a week, received a frustrated reply Stop with the animals, they're all right. <laughs> this brings home the lesson that those on the other side have human limits and should be treated with the same respect we should treat one another. All right, um, more themes. Evil, God, the life review, which we saw a minute ago, um, and judgment slash self-judgment. Uh, this. Um, selection comes from my appendix where I analyze uh, this part of the Apostles Creed um, some of you uh, folks Episcopalians and others might recognize this um, and he will come to judge the living and the dead oh. right page here. 
here. While Hebrew scripture and the New Testament both contain stories of God as judge, especially in the afterlife, the paranormal literature attests instead to self-judgment. The Life Review of Those Who Have Had NDEs, Doyle's Postmortem Testimonies, Many Cases Described by Mediums and Psychics, and the OOBEs of Robert Monroe, all speak to souls being confronted at death by their consciences. The appearances of Jesus to those in our time who have crossed over fall almost without fail on the side of mercy, love, and forgiveness. Even in the cases of evil, bad, or misguided souls, it is not Jesus or God who judges their thoughts or actions. Rather, these spirits appear to go to the planes where they belong, where they have sent themselves, as it were, or where they have chosen to go based on the decisions they have made while in the physical world. The literature suggests that the truly wicked go to a gray, dull place of isolation and or a place of sleep for a period of time until they confront themselves and can move on. Quote, when faced with the judgment, which is but the realization of himself, this is um, Doyle again, he is able to look once and for all into the deeps of himself. He can go forward into ever higher realms of spiritual consciousness and understanding." Unquote. Many of us as well for spiritual growth return to the physical world via reincarnation for as long as it takes to progress spiritually. So the notion of God's judgment should be reevaluated in the face of the paranormal evidence. Uh, there's also a lot, um, or a fair amount, in the uh, literature about suicide. Um, and I understand some sensitivity around that, um, but I hope this proves uh, comforting. While it seems possible that someone may, might make a pre-birth decision to commit suicide, the paranormal evidence is fairly consistent in maintaining that suicide is not usually a good choice. At the same time, many people who do take their own lives report from the other side that they are at peace and growing, that they remain in the presence of their loved ones, and that they realize they made a mistake. While Christian belief condemns suicide, maintaining that such souls are forever damned, and while Christian practice has often denied these persons a Christian burial, these stances are refuted by the paranormal evidence. Those who commit suicide, like all other souls who have departed this world, need love, compassion, and understanding. Van Prague has learned through his spirit guides that, quote, the problems that cause this act of suicide are still very much a part of its mental and emotional mindset, unquote. Spirits often have a great sense of remorse for their action and experience depression. If such, such souls were mentally and or emotionally ill in their earthly state, they need to receive compassion and understanding both from spirits on the other side and from loved ones in the physical world. Eventually, says Van Praag, quote, these souls will become aware of their higher spiritual natures and will begin to see a way, seek a way out of their situations. Above all, these spirits must learn how to forgive themselves, unquote. NDEs experienced by people who attempt suicide further affirm that attempting to take one's own life is generally a mistake and that the afterlife is a positive and hopeful place. Such NDEers report a spiritual rebirth after their return to the physical world. Similarly, Anne per year, an author, recounts the tremendous sorrow and desperation her 15-year-old son Stephen experienced on the other side after he, he hanged himself. Stephen realized almost immediately that he did the wrong thing 
and tried desperately to get back into his physical body. He called out repeatedly to his loved ones and was sickened and hysterical that none could hear or respond to him. He was accompanied by a sweet lady, an angelic being, who helped him understand what was happening to him. He asked her to guide him back to his body, which disgusted him in its messy hair and strange skin. Stephen reported to his mother through her trances and automatic writing, quote, I went over and tried to squeeze into my body, but I kept slipping out, unquote. He finally managed to move into his body, but it did not respond. He begged the lady to help him, but she said, quote, you can't stay in your body anymore. You will have to stay here with me, unquote. <clears throat> he argued and screamed to no avail until eventually he rested. And the spirits assisted him in moving on and dictating the book to his mother in order to help others avoid making the same mistake he did. Um, a woman uh, named Julia Asante, whose book I came across um, at the end of my research, um, had a, a slightly different take on this. Um, her experiences with departed <coughs> souls are slightly different and demonstrate the myriad of nuances around suicide. <coughs> Excuse me. The terminally ill, for instance, <coughs> may choose assisted suicide. Uh, quote, they are generally well primed for the consequences and have little trouble on the other side, unquote. Someone who chooses to sacrifice his or her life on behalf of another, similarly, quote, dies in the exalted awareness of the fundamental oneness of humanity, a great advantage to anyone in passing over, unquote. In cultures such as ancient Rome and Japan, with the tradition of harikiri to preserve honor, Suicides also do not experience a great deal of shame when they cross over due to the communal support and approval. These stories demonstrate a number of truths in conjunction with our survival after death and the fact that our basic personalities survive. First, they confirm that spirits operate through energy as evidenced through computer and other electronic interference. Second, that spirits can and should be spoken to with love and or firmness. Third, that suicide does not always solve one, one's problems from the physical world. And finally, that our honoring the dead and praying for their souls are efficacious acts. And a little about um, reincarnation and karma, the law of cause and effect. <clears throat> okay. If we acknowledged reincarnation, we would know why a place immediately seemed very familiar to us and why we felt that we knew a new acquaintance, acquaintance our whole lives. We have known that person, that soul, and been in relation with him or her before. If we lived our lives under the law of karma, we would be much less apt to cheat, defraud, or harm a neighbor or colleague knowing that our, our unsavory actions will have to be repaid. If we acknowledge reincarnation, we would know that we must live by our finer instincts rather than stoop to greed, self-aggrandizement, and rampant materialism. We would know that these goals will almost certainly need to be confronted in another incarnation on Earth. We would alternatively realize that pursuit of spiritual growth is not just for rabbis, imams, monks, nuns, clergy, and other religion professionals, but for each of us. A life under the law of cause and effect would help us move more quickly through the grief of separation and loss. We would know that physical death is only one stage in our endless spiritual pilgrimage, and that we will meet our loved ones again and again throughout eternity. If we acknowledge reincarnation, we would understand the why of tragedy. The death of a supposed innocent in this world is most likely the playing out of a karmic debt, and the death of a group of people in the same cataclysmic event is almost certainly example, an example of group karma. They have made a pre-birth decision for whatever reason to cross over together. Disease is not always a result of actions in a previous lifetime, 
but many occurrences of disease and serious chronic illness may well be. If we lived by the certitude of karma, we would take comfort in the fact that our good, positive words and deeds, no matter how seemingly insignificant, insignif worthless, or repaid with evil, are never lost or useless. No good is wasted under the law of cause and effect. If we realize the truth of reincarnation, we would understand that it is not luck or fate that matches or pairs us with someone as a life partner. It is planned and for a reason. If we acknowledge the truth of reincarnation, we might be better able to deal with the pain of not attaining a certain dream in this life, such as being married or having children. We would know that we would most likely have had these experiences in previous lives, that we might be able to access them through therapy or regression, and that there are reasons for our current state of affairs. In short, if religious communities and even our wider culture began acknowledging the truth of reincarnation and its corollary karma, we might well see an enhancement of our society's ability to meet more people's deep emotional, psychological, and spiritual needs. But we will never know if we do not try. So here's a little bit of a plug, forgive me. I want to encourage you to actually purchase my book if you haven't already. Thank you if you have. Um, this plea is not so much for my sake, although it has its advantage, but um, for yours, and here are some reasons. Uh, my study is almost unique among the books and articles I consulted as I conducted my research. Nearly all the sources that are out there deal with only one type of evidence, uh, but I deal with all four. <coughs> There's a lot that will blow you away even more than the examples I've given. People who've read the book have told me this, and I was blown away as I came across them. Despite all the wild things I describe and surmise from the evidence, I could only include so much. One big advantage to having an actual copy of the book is the bibliography. The sources I used organized both al alphabetically by author and by topic. Uh, therefore, you can find books and articles that deal in more depth with the evidence. And many uh, are actually here at the library. Um, they're available through um, interlibrary loan, or they can be found on the internet. In addition to the bibliography, I also include an index. Thus, for instance, if you want to look up a particular term or theme when it comes up in your life, or if you want to find all the references to someone like Arthur Conan Doyle, there is a handy way to find the right pages. Uh, finally, having a copy of the book helps you, in, in my humble opinion. Um, I'm obviously not being very modest here, but I do feel that the book can be a very important resource for the rest of your life. I have come to believe that publishing Paranormal <coughs> is probably one of the most important things I have ever done in my life. I hope I've shown at least to some extent why I believe that so passionately. So let me conclude with the final few paragraphs of the book, which I hope will give you one final taste of the hopeful and comforting conclusions about the most basic and serious question of what happens when we leave the physical world. The paranormal literature attests to the truth of love's eternal and essential nature at every turn. The energy experienced by NDEers and OOBEers is that of an abiding love that pervades all things. These people emerge from their experiences with the fruits of love described by St. Paul, patience, kindness, joy, hope. Those who try to find words to describe the God or being they encounter through an NDE or OOBE use the concept of love. The visionaries of Medjugorje in Yugoslavia, uh, which I didn't uh, get to, were permeated with love in the person of the Virgin Mary. Psychics and mediums bring messages of love, joy, peace, and forgiveness from spirits of the deceased to those they have left behind on earth. Evidence from EVPs and ITCs do the same. 
The testimonies of the post-mortem Arthur Conan Doyle and young Stephen, Ann Puryear's son, assure us repeatedly that love is the nature of the afterlife of heaven. Those of, those of us around the world who live lives full of love and opportunities for service do not necessarily need to know intellectually about the nature of the afterlife, the reality of reincarnation, or the law of cause and effect. Obviously, many saints and martyrs throughout human existence have lived their lives without such knowledge. They have certainly tapped into this wisdom from other perspectives. However, a conscious, persistent recognition of the truths of the paranormal evidence, the survival of the individual soul after death, the nature of heaven, the law of cause and effect, and reincarnation provides the modern post-enlightenment Western mind with more than mere faith. The paranormal evidence from the legitimate, rational sources we have examined gives us the kinds of information and solace we need to live our lives fully and without fear in this world at this time in human history, no matter where we are in our life journey. This is not to say that our lives are easy. In fact, the evidence shows that life in a material, physical body is very challenging for most of us. But an understanding of the complete interconnectedness of this world and the next, in the comforting context of love, gives us a more concrete base from which to deal with these challenges. We can thus go far beyond standard religious and philosophical explanations for life's difficulties than just your suffering is God's will or other harmful platitudes. My hope for the reader is that you will more fully explore on your own the many paranormal and related resources that are now avail available. Most of us desire assurance that our lives will continue after we cross over and that we will meet deceased loved ones again on the other side. If we also use this comfort in conjunction with the exploration of spiritual growth on this side, the use of our individual gifts to serve our communities, and the realization of the eternal nature of love, we will witness a wonderfully transformed self and society in the words of Tom and Lisa Butler, there is no death and there are no dead. This is an extraordinary promise to us all. Did, what, what prompted you on this journey? Did, was this purely an intellectual pursuit or did something you experienced send you this way? Um, this is my third book and, and the first two were um, more on my, um, from my doctoral side um, in early church history. But I, I also watch a lot of TV, I shouldn't admit this, but, and thank God for cable, right? Um, so, for a long time I was watching a lot of um, true crime, and as a theologian I kept wondering, what can I do with this true crime um, genre? Um, you know, what makes sense theologically, um, you know, looking at um, the horror of, of murder and, and the, you know, the detectives that solve it and the suffering of, you know, the people that go through this. And I wasn't coming up with much. Um, and then on cable, these shows started to appear. Um, Paranormal State, um, the uh, folks at um, University of Pennsylvania, I think it is, um, who were doing um, uh, that kind of research, and then all these other shows all of a sudden were starting. And it, it started to um, come together from a um, theological point of view, from an ethical point of view. Um, and I was first just going to write an article, but it, it was too vast um, mm. a uh, topic. Um, so I started doing the research and started um, talking about it with um, people. And I actually, as I was doing the book, I um, did, did some um, 
in progress talks at St. Michael's Episcopal, um, which were very well received. Um, and so, you know, it's kind of encouraging. Um, but um, it was, you know, it, it just kind of grew. And um, I, I tried four different publishers, including uh, some where I knew some of the people, they wouldn't touch it with a 10-foot pole. And um, so I needed to uh, self-publish. Um, you know, so that, and thank goodness, um, Northshire Press up in Manchester Center, they were great. Um, so, you know, I did all the formatting, they did the cover for me, and um, so that's, they print the book on demand, um, and they don't charge for shipping. Um, Vermont residents have to pay um, tax, but um, so, you know, it, it uh, that worked out really well, and um, I just, um, you know, I've um, just been really, um, it, it informs my whole life now, you know, what, what I um, learned from all, all this reading. Um, and, you know, so I just really encourage folks to, you know, do more reading about it, because um, it, it's, you know, there's a lot more here than, than I can talk about in an hour. Um, but it's, uh, and, you know, some of my priests are not pleased. Um, you know, they're pretty open-minded about a lot of things, um, but they, um, they kind of seem to automatically think that um, talking about the afterlife um, is not where we should be, that we should be talking social justice. And I totally agree that we should be to talking social justice, and that's what the Episcopal Church certainly does um, anyway. And to me, there's no difference. I mean, you know, I think they go, they go together hand in hand. Um, you know, but um, it answers a lot of questions, in my opinion. Did you say that you had a near death? No, I, I haven't. Um, and that, that's one of the reasons I, I feel like I can be somewhat objective in this book, because, mm -hmm. you know, I've had a few, um, like most people, I think, have had, you know, little things happen. Like, um, as I was writing the book, I was standing at my kitchen sink washing dishes, mm -hmm. and um, I felt um, my mother there, and she and I were not close, but she had died a few years <laughs> earlier. And then there was this vague male presence, and they were encouraging, they, they said, you've got to write this book. I said, yeah, I'm writing this book, right? <laughs> so I was wondering who this male presence was. And I thought it, at first it might be my grandfather, her mother, her father. Um, but then I realized um, that it may have been my favorite um, New Testament uh, professor from Harvard Divinity School, who had died three months after my mother died. Um, and um, they were the same age. They were um, both born in 1929. And I thought, wow. So he's kind of real, he's up there realizing that the truth of some of this stuff, and they're you know both kind of right there tapping me on the shoulder, you know, encouraging me to write the book. So I mean that that's a very little thing, um, but um, it was kind of cool. Well, so. I asked that because initially I thought you had, and then I realized in <clears throat> answering the gentleman's question that you hadn't, because one of the things when I had my near death experience, and that was when I was in my twenties. And the first person I talked to was my doctor because he sat up with me all night long yeah. um, in the hospital. And um, he was Catholic, just like I was. Uh -huh. And I had a million questions. And I asked him if he had ever heard this sort of thing before. And he said, yes, mm -hmm. he had. Yeah. And I said, do you believe it? And he said, well, I want to believe it. <laughs> and he said, not that our church allows that, but we want to believe that. Yeah. And I said, oh. so." I tried to talk to people about it, and I went to my priest, and he wasn't having any. Um, and then I realized that um, to learn what I learned and my near death kind of released me from my need to have a priest to go between, between me and God. Interesting. Yeah. 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 And I no longer needed that. Uh -huh. And since it happened, I have never, I mean, I've joined different churches. I've tried a lot of different churches. 
I can't belong to organized religion. It just doesn't work anymore. Oh, that's. I have a direct relationship, and it's yeah. not an O. Oh, it's yeah. a gift. Yeah. Terrific. Yeah. I'm fine with it. I go to any that's church good. I want to, and oh, I'm good. fine with it. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I just it's just not a subject that a lot of clergy wants to talk about yeah that's it's not in their polity you know and and that's very unfortunate I mean the only denomination that does is spiritualism you know and I, I don't know you know how well I consider lively. myself a Christian spiritual yeah that's what I call myself. yeah yeah um, and one of the um, the another impetus for writing this book and I and I kind of gear some of this toward clergy because um, from a pastoral point of view, your example is perfect. Because you know we have some people in our parish um, who've had near-death experiences, um, and they don't really feel comfortable talking about it with the clergy. And right. I think that's horrible. I think that's a yeah. horrible shame. Um, and the other interesting thing is that um, some of these uh, very prominent mediums are Roman Catholic. Yep. Yeah. Very often. Yeah. And. Um, they, they don't really sense, you know, that much difference, but of course the hierarchy probably does. So, um, you know, it's, it's really pretty unfortunate, that, you know. Well, I, right now I'm actually working on a book. And the thing is that the reason I'm writing the book is because I started reading about all this stuff years ago. Mm -hmm. And it, it made me much, I was already intuitive before it happened, but I got extremely intuitive and some amazing things have happened. Yeah. And I, I got to the point where I made sure I had witnesses uh -huh. so that I could yeah. validate it. Yeah. And uh, my husband is very supportive because he's seen a lot. And now I'm working on my book. And the thing is that why, why I did the research was to help me validate that I wasn't going nuts. Right. Because right. the first thing I did when some of these things happened was go to a doctor, yeah. have an exam, have yeah. them tell me you're fine. Oh, that's what Monroe yeah. did too. Spend time yeah. in the shrink. Right. You're fine. Right. And um, right. then I even went to a funeral director and asked him if he knew if anybody would ever had these. And the ambulance drivers. <laughs> I, it's amazing <laughs> how common this all is. Yeah. But, but kind of underground. Afraid, yeah, yeah, people are afraid yeah. right. of the reaction they're going to get, and people thinking that they're crazy and yeah. rumoring that around. And now it's so wonderful because I'm 70 and I just don't give it to <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Well, It's a good time. So now I'm ready to write and publish. Good, good. Well, let us know. But that's why even Alexander's books are bestsellers, you know, because this, this you know, strikes a chord. Yeah. You know, with a lot of Absolutely. people. It's not that it happens to everybody, but um, it happens enough. And, and Jeffrey Long is, is one of the doctors that um, wrote the book on, on um, you know, the scientific um, stuff um, about a big study that he did right. on this. So the, right. that's um, what I cited there. So, yeah, thank you for all that. That's great. Um, anybody over on this side? <laughs> I will, okay. So the questions I had didn't relate at all to your talk. So I'm not going to ask those questions, but I have wondered about the opioid deaths. Mm. I mean, there have been a tremendous amount of people who have died from overdosing, and then Narcan brings them back. Oh, right. And I always wonder yeah. about that. Like, what, what are these people experiencing? They've been mm. basically touched on the other side. Yeah, I, I haven't uh, read anything about that. Has anyone else um, seen anything about um, the folks, I, I imagine they, they might, unless it's a totally different physiological thing that happens to them, um, it could very well um, be similar. Some of them are dying repeatedly and coming back. Wow. It's a really scary yeah. time right now. Yeah. yeah. And I, I don't know much about that. So, what, so an overdose is uh, a bit. <laughs> if a person overdose, it means that he died. I, I was thinking over those, it can, the possibility that it can come back is there. So. Well, who knows about the, the physiology of, of this? Um, you know, they, I don't know how Narcan works, um, but are, are they actually um, clinically dead when, when they get the, some, of them, yeah. some of them? Yeah, I guess not I, all I don't of know them. how it works either. It's like yeah. a miracle. It blocks yeah. the receptors in the brain, Narcan, it blocks the receptors. Receptors in the brain, so you stop having the effect that you oh, would from the, the opioid. opioid. Okay. 
Yeah. 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 It, pre it prevents any of the dose from be continuing to be introduced into the body. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it probably helps to re-trigger the heart and the breathing mm -hmm. and things like that that are being suppressed by the drug. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah and I, I didn't come across any of this in my research, so. Mm -hmm. All of my questions <laughs> were about other levels. They were just about other levels. I think you have to be really careful not to uh, get too much into um, well, to focus on what happens physically here, because someone who does drugs, um, they don't do it because they want to and because they want to ruin their lives and ruin every member of their family. That's not why they do it. For one reason or another, they get into it. And it's just like any other sickness. And the thing is, when you have a near death, the first thing you are overwhelmed by is the amount of compassion and love. That's all there is. White light, love, mm -hmm. compassion, mm -hmm. there's no bad. Mm -hmm. and, and God really sees us all um, as his children. And he realizes we're weak, <laughs> humans are not perfect, um, and he expects all these bad behaviors and good behaviors from us. And he is the giver of divine grace. And I can, rem I can remember just everything about it and it was almost like showing up with all your problems and having and having someone say don't worry about it mm -hmm. we're going to fix this mm -hmm. yeah. I, I, it, it's not it's not like I was raised in the Catholic religion to think that well like if you commit suicide you go to hell that's not the way it is at all um, God judges you by earnest intention whatever is in your heart and your soul not your actions, but what you, not what actually happened, but what you intended from the bottom of your heart to happen. Actions just, are important. Yeah. Too, it, as, as well. Yeah. Just because it went wrong, that's not always your <laughs> right. fault. Right. Can you speak to other biblical references about the paranormal or the transpersonal? Well, what we think happened, um, Justinian and Theodora, were um, emperor and empress um, in the sixth century, I think it is. Um, and Theodora um, was apparently quite evil um, and influenced Justinian. And um, she um, killed some people, I guess, or that's the theory. Um, and she, um, th they had the power because they were head of the church and head of the state at that point, to um, Roman Catholic, well Byzantine at, at that point, the, oh, you know wow. when they were together, um, and um, I, don't, I don't know this verbatim. It's some of this in the book, as far as we can piece together. But um, she basically could decide on on the theology. Um, so she, being evil, wanted to go right to heaven and, and you know, right to God and not have to pay for any of the bad stuff she did. So the theory is that um, they had control of the monasteries that were copying the manuscripts. Mm -hmm. So um, we think that um, she expunged um, a whole bunch of references mm -hmm. to um, reincarnation. I mean, you can see, you know, pieces um, if you read it with, with that kind of in mind, but there aren't very many left. Um, I also think that um, Jesus in those years between like when he was 12 and when he started his ministry at 30 um, could very well have gone to the East and studied with um, masters, yeah, yeah, um, to learn about reincarnation and karma and all those kind of things. Um, there, you know, that's scholarship hasn't, you know, really done a whole lot with that, but... Um, Except suppressive. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. The, yes, the normal way of, you know, dealing with that kind of thing. So I think um, uh, there's a whole thing about um, Jesus and the resurrection. Um, I, I get into in this too, that um, you know, on the scholarly side, the scholars don't really believe in resurrection, um, but from the paranormal evidence, it's quite possible um, that Jesus, being um, such an advanced human being, could very well have have died and. Um, resuscitated himself in some fashion and appeared spiritually to, to people like what appears in the New Testament. 
Um, and that's um, a whole big topic. Um, and, um, you know, it could explain a lot. But um, so we don't have a whole lot. The, the other thing um, is origin, origin, the church father. Um, and probably did believe in reincarnation and um, this whole thing with Justinian and Theodora and I, somewhere in, in there, um, they um, decided they didn't like Origen um, because of his belief in reincarnation and all that kind of thing. Um, so they sort of, um, you know, pushed him aside too, even though we still study him. And that's a little convoluted too. A lot of this gets kind of lost in the, the gray areas of history. Um, but. You know, I think it's really a shame. I think Western civilization really took a, a wrong turn um, when reincarnation and karma and pre-birth decisions went out the window. You know, I think we lost a lot. So, yeah. Thank you, Jerry, for sure, I just... <laughs> we we made a deal. So <laughs> in a way, yeah. <laughs> we got the book from the library okay. thanks to Jerry. <laughs> I, I just wanted to mention for a. Um, a local historical perspective on spiritualism. I was fortunate mm -hmm. enough a couple of years ago in uh, some genealogical coursework I was doing through Boston University to uh, go into an archive. My assignment was to go into archive, select a letter or diary that has not been digitized. So you couldn't find it online. You had to go to the repository and then report on any family uh, relationships, uh, genealogical relationships. So I went to the Brattleboro Historical Society and in one of their boxes on correspondence, I came across 24 letters written between 1886 to 1889 to Edward Edwards of Brattleboro, who was a uh, local wheelwright. And he lived up on Prospect Street. And uh, they were sent to him from his two wives, his mother, his two brothers, a niece, from the afterlife through three mediums. An automatic writing? Probably. Uh, probably. Yeah. yeah, it was hard to discern what they were, but uh, uh, so I said, wow, this is an interesting one. So I <laughs> submitted it to my instructor, and she said, that's the first time we've ever had any uh, diaries or letters from, uh, <laughs> from, from the afterlife. So at any rate, it was a very interesting study. I had to identify who the mediums were, and I did figure out uh, at least two of them. And, uh, you know, there were eight million spiritualists uh, in the country in the 19th century. It was a, it was quite a movement, sort of a part of the Great Awakening, and uh, and many of them were in New England. Uh, in fact, there's the the longest running spiritualist community, which began in 1872, is uh, right here at Lake Pleasant in uh, Montague. It still it still operates, and uh, so uh, I figured many of those mediums must have come from. From uh, from that uh, from that community, but uh, at any rate, they're they're very poetic. Um, I'm not making any judgment on on it. I'm you know not uh, not here to believe or disbelieve. But uh, I just thought they were just very interesting. They each had their own style, and uh, it was kind of interesting because one wife would write and said, "Well, we're." You know, I know your other wife is here, and we're good friends, and right. one of us will meet you yeah. on, when you die. And uh, uh, from he, the last letter is dated November 1889, and February 12th, 1890, he's dead. Yeah. So if nothing else, uh, they provided, a, I'm sure, a great amount of uh, relief and comfort to him in his uh, in his remaining years. So at any rate, it's. Um, there's a copy of it in the library, it's been cataloged, but you can also download it uh, for free from the vermonthistory.org website. You just go there and look under um, Vermont History Journal articles. It's spring 2018. Great, thanks a lot. Sure, yeah, it's fun to write. Oh, they, you know, there are some wild stories that um, the mediums come across, um, and you know, it's, it's very, it's really astounding, so. Yeah. I just had a quick question about, about how it could all start. If, if we're all, re is the idea that we're all reincarnated? And if it is, <laughs> what was the impetus? How did, where was the first soul? Or how did it, uh, yeah, that's, just the mechanics of it, I sort of wonder about. Well, good question. Um, 
from what I take from a lot of this, um, there is no beginning and no end. There, you know, the, um, so, you know, there's beginning and end on Earth, you know, and so some of our early um, incarnations were, you know, really quite primitive, um, you know, so, um, but, Perhaps but, it, even not evolved, you know, back well, it's always it's it always seems to be human to human, but not um, insect or bird or you know, although some animals seem to be kind of um, uh, advanced. Um, but if you, if you want to get into this, I've actually done one past life regression, which is a way into this, and mediums are, are another way. Um, and I, I don't have the name of a, a good medium around here, although there might be some. But um, I, I did a, um, without going into too much detail, but I did a past life regression with um, um, Susan Rosano, who's Dennis Waring's wife. And she's, um, some of you probably know her. And she does um, other kinds of hypnos hypnosis, but it was a hypnotic thing. So that, that's one way um, you can get into it. And the thing is, um, you know, if, if you get into a past life that um, you really can't relate to, you're not going to learn much from it. So that's kind of the way I figure, you know, it, when we're um, just barely coming out of evolution and, and becoming human, um, you know, we're not going to understand something in the 21st century, for, you know, for instance. So that, you know, um, one estimate I saw um, said that we were probably, uh, most of us are probably incarnated 85 to 100 times. Um, and um, I personally don't want to come back again, but, um, you know, because it's hard. Um, yeah, right. Um, but, you know, we're still going to go on for a while. Um, but, you know, we're supposed to learn. The, one of the other things, interesting things, is um, a lot of, um, and this isn't just my theory, I, I've heard it from others too, um, a lot of baby boomers are um, victims of a holocaust. Um, so we, we are, um, you know, we were some of the um, six million Jews who died or others that died, and so we came back um, in the early, uh, 1950s, early 60s into this life. Um, and another theory is um, that some of the soldiers um, in the armies um, who uh, were murdering folks in the um, World War II era um, <laughs> might be coming back as, um, as victims. Um, so, you know, there's, and that's, that's sort of a theory. But, you know, you can tap into that if, if you, um, you know, do a past life regression, possibly. Um, and sometimes mediums will come. The, the Butler book actually um, gives a lot of, uh, if you're into this, they um, tell you how to do an EVP. They, they talk about all the instrumentation and um, you can you know, set this up for yourself if you, if you want to try to you know, reach somebody. Um, I have no desire to do that, but um, you, you asked about um, planes, different levels of yeah. Because yeah. um, Doyle gets into that, um, and it got to be so confusing what he was saying that um, I didn't bother to commit any of it to memory. But um, you know, people that are pretty bad on on Earth are are very um, when they cross over, they're still pretty close to the Earth. Um, so, but you know, they're going to a place where there are no victims. They, they, they're going to a place where there are other evil souls, so that's no fun for them, you know, to not have a victim. So, but the, you know, <laughs> right? So um, they, so there are there are levels apparently, you know, because Doyle was seeing some of this. Um, but like I said, it was it was so confusing that I, you know, I couldn't figure it out. But um, the reason I asked about that is that. Um, Supposedly, on some levels, there are different religions, for instance. And that, like you, Slash, I yeah, it's kind of funny. Anyway, um, 
<laughs> and that, that um, certain religions like they'll gather and there'll be certain rays or lights that will attract them. Mm. And I remember people saying, oh, go to the white light. Mm. Mm. And I just, mm. I wondered if, like you said, group souls, and that's sort of mm. lending towards that question of mm. the whole group soul concept of when you recognize yeah. someone and you don't know how you know that person, but there's a real honest recognition of that other person yeah. in a deep way. Well, even Alexander has a, um, an example of that. Um, not to give away his um, book, if people haven't read it, but um, you know this, this guide of his um, turns out to be a, a sister who had died, I think it was a sister, who, who had died before he was born. So um, that, that's where that connection came in, and he, he found out, you know, after the experience. But um, he, Do Doyle had very high regard for um, Native American religion, I think, if I recall right, and um, and Buddhism. Um, but you know, Christianity has a lot going for it. You know, it, it's just some of this other stuff is is not part of that. Um, and certainly Judaism, um, you know, all, all the world religions, you know, um, I think have, um, you know, a lot going for them and, you know, bits and pieces are, are very um, relevant, you know, to this. Yeah. Did you cover um, some of what I think is really convincing is children that we'll talk about children? Children? That, yeah, and that, and they'll give all these details about past lives. So do you cover that in your book, or? Um, a little bit. Um, there, um, who was it that did the, the uh, big study on it? Um, I'm blanking on his name, but it, it's in the bibliography. Um, and I, he died a few years ago, but yeah, there have been big studies on that. Yeah. Um, especially in India, where right. where reincarnation is is believed in. Um, and it, yeah, you know, and it's fascinating. It, and they've gone and like found the yeah. actual people, found the details, like introduced the right. child to, oh, this is, you know, your sister in a past life. Yeah. And, and there's just all yep. kinds of, yeah. Lots of evidence for that. Yeah. Um, you know, and um, I'll think of his name in the middle of the night, but um, <laughs> sorry, you know, blanky. I'm trying to funnel down a lot of things into some brevity. Um, I think I, I feel I feel very strongly that when we have experiences, we tend to interpret them through the filters that we have on or already. Mm -hmm. It's like eyes and ears, but beliefs also. Mm -hmm. And I had an experience some years ago. I was living uh, in a kind of cabin in the woods and it was up five steps with a very, um, the, the deck was only about five feet wide with a sliding glass door and I caught my toe under the top step. I had things in my arms so I couldn't break my phone and I went smack oh. into the glass, which held, luckily. Um, <coughs> I then hit the deck, and I had a pretty good concussion afterwards. But in those nanoseconds between this hit and falling to the to the deck, I had an experience of being somewhere else. Huh. Uh -huh. And it was very vivid, and it's still very vivid to me now. Yeah. I was at a committee meeting. The committee. <laughs> in, the, in your vision. Yeah, uh, it wasn't a business committee. It was, it was a committee on which I sit that determines how my life is organized and, and what happens. And the, the subject under discussion at the moment was, does she die now or does she Come, uh, does she come back to witness? No, not come back, but continue, continue because life. she has things that she yeah. must do yeah. in her life. Yeah. Well, you don't have to die to have a near death. Mm -hmm. Come sure. close to it uh -huh. and still have one. Uh -huh. Well, yeah, I've, I've had other experiences that yeah. I, I, it's too much to get into right now. But um, so the the. The entities at the, at the table 
were, some of them were human, and none of them I really recognized as people that I knew. Yeah, they were your, your some of them could have come from the bar in Star Wars. Uh -huh. <laughs> they weren't necessarily yeah. Yeah. human, or, or yeah. there was some that was just light. Yeah, yeah. And we were all deliberating about this, yeah, and the decision was made that I still had work to do, right? And that I was not to die now. Yeah, and that was in like. Three yeah, or four yeah. seconds. Time, time is real different on the other side. Well, yeah, <laughs> and the word eternity does not mean, as we're all told as children, a long time. Yeah. It means outside of time. Mm. 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 That's a good way to put it. Eternity yeah. literally uh, means uh -huh. out, uh, outside uh -huh. of time. Yeah. There are a lot of examples of that, in, in, that kind of thing in, in the literature. Yeah. You know, where, where somebody, um, you know, uh, died at, at eight, 19 years old and, and um, you know, came back or communicated with his relatives and said, you had me two years longer than you were supposed to because I was supposed to die at age 17. You know, and th things like that. You know, um, it, it's, you know, it's... Well, it's, circumstances change. Right, right. But it's really interesting. That, that, but I, know, that I, um, I came to this idea of decision making outside of this reality. Um, through a psychotherapist that I went to who had Buddhist beliefs mm -hmm. and she said you know our parents are not our tormentors they're our teachers and we come in to a particular place with particular parents to set up the what you need yeah. to go through this time. We make that decision. That's the whole pre-birth decision thing that, that I didn't yeah. get into yeah, too much. Yeah, which is committee. Yeah, yes. Yeah, and um, our, you know, we all have guardian angels around us, and, and it's often um, a deceased parent or, or, or an aunt or uncle or you know, somebody else. And you know, that's kind of who I pray to, um, because you know, whoever my guardian angels are, you know, hell, or thank you, um, you know, things. It's a, it's a little more concrete than God. What, what, is, you know, what does God mean? Um, and, and to me, that it just makes a lot more sense, you know, that, and they shift off, you know, because they have their jobs to do right. too. Right. So, you know, when somebody's, um, you know, the job is done and somebody else dies to take over, you know, they might go off there or be reincarnated sometimes. Um, but I, I wanted to say one thing more that spins off from this uh, committee idea that we have deliberation about why we're yeah. coming into Definitely. this incarnation. Yep. And I, I do believe there are sequential ones or possibly concurrent ones. Mm -hmm. um, but the subject of abortion. Um, That's in here. <laughs> uh -huh. People are always screaming about the killing of innocents and so on and so on. Well, what if this innocent comes in to teach the parents Mm -hmm. something that they need to know. That they yeah. come in, in intentionally and they don't stay around very long yeah. because that's the teaching. That's, um, yeah, uh, Van Prague, I think, was, um, I'm looking for my index here because, um, yeah, um, yeah, abortion um, is one of those liberal progressive things that Van Prague kind of came across because it's, for the growth of the mother, oftentimes, um, and and not to be condemned. Um, so, and several other things like that. Not to get into politics too much. I know. <laughs> um, there, if um, if you do want a copy of the book, I left um, a few sheets over there by the door um, with um, some links on it. Um, you can get the book through Northshire Press. Um, you can't just go and buy it there in person because um, they, they print it. Um, so you have to give them some advance warning. Um, thank you for holding that up. Um, and um, I have a website too. Where I do a um, you know, bi-weekly blog on a whole bunch of different things. Um, so yeah, if you go to my website, uh, wisdomwordspf.org, um, on, the, on the home page there's a link to um, Northshire Press and you can um, get the book there. But thank you so much. Thank this has you. been um, a big crowd, bigger than I thought we would have. So I really appreciate everybody coming thank out. You. Thank, thank you. you.